I'd like to sing the chorus, I love you, Lord. Father, bless your word to our hearts that we might profit from it, that we might be attentive to it. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you again today. We're looking at the book of Genesis. It's the beginning of the Bible. The key word is beginnings. And uh, the first 11 chapters talk about the beginning of the human race, and there are four main events. There is creation, and I make the big world with my hands. Creation, there's the fall, and we're looking at the fall today. There is the flood, and then there is the Tower of Babel, and people are scattered. Four major events in the first 11 chapters, the history of mankind. From the chapter 12 to the end, to chapter 50, we have the history of the Hebrew race. So we have four major prof, uh, patriarchs in the Hebrew race. So we have uh, Abraham, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and then we have Joseph. So that's a great outline for the book of Genesis. The Genesis is a bookend on a shelf where Revelation is on the very end. And so we have beginnings here and we have forever on this side. We have a great God, a great book. And I hope you're in the habit of reading every day uh, because this is our manual for life. If you take a course in uh, mechanics or you take a course in sewing or you take a course in computer sciences or business, you have a textbook. And so it's important that you have a textbook and that textbook is the Bible, God's word. It is truth. And so we're looking at Genesis chapter 3 today and we're looking at the first seven verses, the first six verses. So we're going to look at the temptation of mankind and the fall of mankind. There are four voices in chapter 3. There is the voice of deception we're going to look at today. And the voice of deception from the serpent. We're going to next week look at the voice of love, the voice of judgment, and the voice of grace. So if you have some time this week to look over chapter 3 and read it over again, we would encourage you. Now I have something for you to look at. You see this picture here? Which door would you enter? Would you enter the left door or the right door? You've got to make up your mind. How many go in the left door? How many go in the right door? Okay, well, some of you are really slow in deciding. This is a true event. Um, if you go in the right door, you're going to walk into a mirror. <laughs> I was at a, at a resort somewhere some years ago, and I walked into the right door, and it was the mirror. The left door is the true door. The right door is just an image in a mirror. You see how easily we can be deceived? How, the, how about this one? How many legs? Oh my. You know there's no six legs in that elephant. How do you know? Because you went to school and you studied animals and you know from truth, you know from experience that there is only four legs on an elephant and there's no way anybody's going to tell you there's six. But your eyes are deceiving you. Are you deceived by the word of God? Are you deceived by the words and voices of this world? Some time ago, and so we need to stop believing lies. Stop believing lies. Okay? And in John 8, 32, it says, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth was the door on the right was in a mirror, so now you know you're free. You're not going to walk into it. And you know from your own experience and knowledge that there's only four legs to an elephant. Now, if you're blind, you might come from the rear end of the elephant. You'll have a different imagination of what it might look. And from the front, it would be different. And from the side, it would be different. If you were little, it would be different. You think the trunk was the tree or might be a trunk of a car or might be the trunk... Uh, a box where you put all your clothing. Even the word trunk is misleading, isn't it? And so we need to know God's word. We must not be deceived. Eve was deceived from our story. Are you deceived? Are you deceived? Well, the only way you're not going to be deceived is if you know the truth. Years and years ago, when uh, the person worked in the bank, 
they handled all the real stuff, the real bills. And so they got a feel for what the real bill was all about. And when a counterfeit came along, they could identify it really quickly because they knew the real stuff, you see. If you try and learn all the counterfeits out there, there's going to be more that you don't know. But if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And that is so very, very important. I met a man uh, who told me that he was a Christian for a long, long time. And uh, there were some issues about my preaching that he wasn't very pleased about. And so he said, let's have coffee, and we chatted back and forth. And he told me that he had been a Christian for a long time and that my scripture, my preaching was a little bit too much gospel. I talked too much about this Jesus guy. And in the course of the conversation, he was telling me all the things, and I just listened and listened. And then he got to a point where he said, you know, you mentioned the, uh, in the Bible, you mentioned hell, and you know what? Hell does not exist. And I go, okay, you read, uh, you know that you've been a Christian for a long time, you've taught Sunday school, how do you know that hell does not exist? It's in the Bible. I can show you several places where hell exists. This is the truth. You know what he said? He said, I don't read the Bible. You don't read the Bible, and yet you got an opinion about hell. Some people just don't know when to be quiet. They think they know it all, and it's totally wrong. And so it's very, very important that we understand. And, and chapter 3 is significantly important. And as we begin today, I just wanted to point out several things that, that are on your sheet. And I would love for you to keep notes because then you can reflect upon it during the week. If you don't have the answers, that's okay. Phone somebody else and ask if they got the answer. And uh, if you need to have me send you the answer, I've got the answer sheet right here. A good teacher always has the answer sheet. And so as we begin, we need to remember that when God created the heavens and the earth, even before the heavens and the earth, that he created two kinds of beings. Do you know who those two kinds of beings are? The first beings are spiritual beings. We call them angels. God created every single angel. Okay? And you can see that in the scriptures there. I have a lot of scriptures for you to look at. The second kind of being is a human being. So we have a spiritual being, which are the angels, and they're in charge of the heavens. They live in a heavenly realm, and they do ministry for the Lord, and they worship him, and there's different ranks of angels. There's the army of God who minister and do his bidding, angels. Billy Graham calls the angels God's secret servants. They're always working behind the scenes, and we don't know where they come and they go. But human beings God created, and we saw that in chapter 1 and 2, that God created man, and they are to govern over the earth. So in the Genesis account, we find that man has some very, very special relationships. In chapter 1 and 2, we see that man has an unbroken fellowship and harmony with God. God comes and walks to them and with them in the cool of the evening, God talks to them, and God, they enjoy the fellowship. There's nothing between them all as well, and there's a responsibility to obey God, and God has given some commandments. He says, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden. You can go about and do whatever you need to do. Only one thing is prohibited. Do not eat from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of knowing right and wrong. You see, if you obey, you will always know the right. And if you disobey, you'll know the wrong. And I don't want you to know that. Know the right and do the right. Ye have unbroken fellowship with each other. Adam and Eve, there's no argument. They work together and they till the ground and they take care of the garden. They have a responsibility to obey each other. So there's harmony between man and God. There's harmony between man and woman. There's harmony with all of creation because everything works together. It's a beautiful garden, luscious and fruitful, harmonious and peaceful and serene in every single way, perfect in every single way. Well, we find out from our story today that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals. So where does this serpent come from? 
He shows up in the middle of nowhere. So the origin of sin. How did sin come in and disrupt everything? This virus, this infection, where did it come from? Well, the origin of sin, according to Romans 5, verse 12, tells us that sin entered the world through one man. His name is Adam. Romans 5, 12, sin entered into the world through Adam. Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam made a deliberate choice. And we'll find out more about that next week. But we read in our story today, where was Adam? Adam was right beside Eve, and Adam didn't speak up. Yeah. Sometimes we as men don't take the leadership that we should be. We're not playing up to the role that we should be. And so we see that uh, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast. And so we see here that sin entered into the world. How did sin come into the universe? Yeah. Well, it came into the universe through Satan. And we see that in Isaiah 14. If you have time sometime to look at Isaiah 14, you will read about a king. And what it's really talking about is Satan. And you'll read the story in Ezekiel chapter 28. So today is not the uh, time to go through and describe the fall of Satan and his third of the angels went with him and they fell to the earth. And so they in, then began a conflict between the satanic forces, the fallen angels, which are called devils and demons, unclean spirits, because they are spiritual beings, created and fighting against God the Almighty. They have a losing battle. So if we know we have a losing battle, the propaganda is to lie and deceive so that we can get as many people to come along the path of unrighteousness and wickedness. The righteous will stand in the assembly. The wicked will be like chaff that the wind blows away. Psalm 1. And so sin enters into the universe through Satan, into the world through Adam. What is the meaning of sin? Well, to sin means to rebel. To sin means to defect. You know, but now you're going to go and do your own thing. I like the word sin in terms of the letter I. It's right in the middle, and it's all about independence of God. When we sin, we are independent of God. We're not going to trust him to provide. We're going to steal. We're not going to trust him for wisdom, but we're going to do it our own way. We're not going to be patient for his timing. We're going to do it now. And we want it now. So when you are I independent of God, then you're sinning because you're not in harmony with him. The consequences of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Sin, le sin leads to death. God told us already in the last chapter, chapter 2, verse 17, uh, seven, 17, it says that if you eat of this tree, you will certainly die. You are sure to die. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but apparently it is you are to die, to die twice. An emphasis, you're gonna die. And what does death mean? Death means separation. Death means separation. The death of a relationship is separation. I met a father who I congratulated on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And he said, it's the worst day of my life. I said, why? He said, my boy at 17, we had a big argument and he went out the front door. He slammed it on me and I've never seen him since. It's been 13, 15 years. I don't know whether the boy is alive or not. I don't know whether he's married or not. I don't know whether he's healthy or not. I don't know whether he's in jail or not. I don't know whether he... It's the worst day of my life. Because the death of a relationship. To know God is not a religion. To know God is a relationship. It's not in your head, it's in your heart. I love you, Lord. That's not religion, that's relationship. Do you know him, more importantly, he does know you. 
and so are you walking with him. Death. When we die, the body gets put into the ground, the soul and spirit goes to be with God. There's a separation of body with soul and spirit. When our loved ones die, they go to be with God and we are still here, so we're separated for a distance. But those who die um, are in a different place. For people die, but love never dies. And so sometimes I have an issue. Do I say I da have a dad or I don't have a dad? I don't have him physically here with me. I can't call him and hug him and spend time having a coffee and cake with him and hearing his stories, but I know he's alive. He's probably more alive now than he was when he was with me because he's in glory. And I do have a father, not here, but there. When my dad died, I didn't lose my sonship. I am still a son. And the same thing with God. So the penalty leads to death. Death means separation. Now, who is this Satan? Well, again, we don't have much time to go to, but you have time to look at the bottom of page one there. There we describe him. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 15 says, he is a creature. He is not God. He's a creature. He has limited abilities. Yes, most powerful. I wouldn't want to meet Satan in the corner, in a dark corner, because... I can't fight him. He is more powerful. And don't play around with demonic things, witchcraft, black magic. Don't, you don't know what you're getting into. You know, Dungeons and Dragons and Ouija boards. You're just playing with fire. Stay away from those things. So he's a creature, but he thinks he's God. You see, but he will be accountable to the Creator. He is accountable to the Creator. Um, Ezekiel 28 also tells us that he's a cherub. Cherub means one cherub. Cherubim means lots of cherubs. In Hebrew, the word I am means plural. And so cherub, he's a cherub. Well, who are the cherubs? They are a rank of angels, the highest order of rank of angels, who are around the throne of God, who guard the holiness of God. They guard the holiness of God. And so Satan was the highest created angelic being. If you read that description of him, mine, he's got everything going for him. But he wants to be God. He wants to have an uprising, a rebellion. To sin is to rebel, and he's going to rebel. You see, well, how can he do that? Well, he was given a free will. Angels are given free wills to serve God or not, and you and I are given a free will. You see, he's also called the evil one. And by the way, talking about cherubs, when Adam and Eve are cast out and banished from the garden, guess what? There are cherubim at the door, and there's a rotating fiery sword. You might remember that. He is the evil one. He is the liar from the beginning. His native tongue is lying. Have you ever met a person who keeps lying all the time and giving you excuses and telling you this and telling you that? Have you, could you ever have a friendship with him? You never know where you stand. Because his story changes all the time. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we see that Satan is the god of this world. And his job, his strategy is to blind the eyes of the unbeliever, to keep you in the dark. Remember what God created, and there was darkness that surrounded the deep and was over the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the darkness and the waters, and God said, let there be light. Do you remember John 1? It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was the light. And the light was the life of man. Jesus Jesus. And so Satan wants to keep you in the dark. He doesn't want you to know the truth. He wants you to keep that Bible in the back seat of your car all week and just maybe bring it in on Sunday morning. He wants you to have lots of Bibles on your shelf, but you don't have to pick it up. It looks good when everybody else comes along. You might be able to quote one or two verses, but have you learned and memorized the verse this week? The fifth commandment, sixth commandment, I think, the sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. Correct? Thou shalt not murder. 
Ah, huh, did I catch you on that one? See, life is sacred. It says thou shalt not murder. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. We have to kill in defense. We have to kill beasts in order to eat. See, that little simple thing you might have missed. How well do we know the word of God? How the word of God. And of course, in Revelation 12, we see that Satan is called the dragon. All right, there's a new spacecraft that's gone up, and they call it the dragon. My goodness, you know, yeah. It's incredible, these words that are in scripture that come out, all these movies and shows that liar and omens and angels. and There is a hunger for the spiritual things, but many are deceived. He's also called the ancient serpent. Ancient serpent. So that's in Revelation 12, the ancient serpent. That's why we can say that the snake is Satan. And the picture that was put up there earlier, and uh, we'll see it now, is that this particular picture, you see the snake there. The snake, um, just go back one. No, that's good. That's good. That's good. The snake there, you see, it doesn't have any legs. That's the wrong picture of the snake. You see, that's after the curse. He was told he was going to now crawl on his belly. So we made the assumption that he actually walked on some legs. Yeah, I studied biology and we looked at uh, skeletons and I don't know how many snakes, but there, are, there is one or two snakes that I saw, the skeleton of, where there were bones in the middle of the muscle not attached to the skeleton at all. They're called vestigial organs. And I asked the professor, why is that bone in the middle of the muscle not hooked up to any other thing? He said, well, I guess according to evolutionary theory, that thing might have been walking on the legs some time ago. You see, God's truth is always true. The more we research and discover, the more we'll find out. And so in speaking to, uh, in speaking to Eve, Satan raises two doubts. Let's read this. Now the serpent was more crafty. Did God really say, did God actually say you must not eat? of any tree in the garden. Well, he didn't say that, but he's trying to get Eve into a conversation. And so we see that uh, Eve says, we may eat, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree, that of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, and, and neither shall you touch it. What does she do? Yeah, that's right. She added to God's word. God didn't say that. And by the way, Eve wasn't there when God set the first commandment. He gave it to Adam. And then later on, Adam, uh, Adam, from Adam's rib, God created Eve. So the message went to Adam. Adam passed it on to Eve. And I don't know where the message went wrong, but Eve ends up quoting it wrong. She didn't know what God said. She didn't quote it right. She misquoted it. So that was the first thing. And you notice, lest you, lest you see the question mark there, she left something out. What did she leave out? Well, she left out the word surely, most certainly. You will die. You see? Yeah, Eve wasn't perfect. She left it out. She was careless. And so... We have here, uh, you will not surely die. And the next slide says, you will not surely die. Well, guess what? That's Satan saying it. He quotes it right. Satan knows the Bible. He's been around for years. He quoted it right. She didn't. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. That's true. Like, you'll go, you'll understand. And you will be like God. No, you won't be like God. God is all-powerful, you're not all-powerful. God is all-knowing, you're not all-knowing. God is in the heavens, and you're walking on two feet on the ground. You're not going to be like God. But you were created in the image of God. You're already in the image of God. What else do you need? Well, Satan is there. And uh, he knows the voice of deception. Okay, on your notes, 
In speaking with Eve, Satan raised two doubts. What are the two doubts? The first one in verse 1, that he raised the doubts about God's love. To raise the doubts about God's love. He raised doubts about God's word. If God really loved you, like, did he say you're not supposed to eat any of these trees? You see, like, trying to get confusion. You know, you just throw in a lot of information in there, and then people don't know what's right and wrong anymore. Right? And so, he raised his doubt about God's love. God doesn't really love you. See, he gave you a warning. He says, don't do this. If he really loved you, he'll let you do what you want. If you really love your kids, you let them run across the highway, right? So they can get run over. If you love your kids, you let them go swimming in the deep water so they can drown. No, no, no. There are limitations for your safety and for your good. God is good. Raises doubts about God's word. You will not die. Come on. You will not die. So the application today is let's daily engage in God's word so we will never doubt God's love. When you and I have a pity party and we feel sorry for ourselves, we're doubting God's love. Right? If he loved me, he would fix it right away. If he loved me, he'd take away the pain. If he loved me, he'd... No, no, no. He loves you. He doesn't change. Trust him. Never doubt God's love. You remember the time when your kids said to you, Mommy, I hate you. Right? They were doubting your love. But your love never ended. Your love was consistent. And if we in our humanity can love our children as much as we can, how great here is God's love for us? Doubts about God's word. Never doubt God's word. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So is there a moment in time where he will abandon you? No. Whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. As you a believer, if I asked you if you were to die, would you be going to heaven? Some say, well, I don't know. Well, God said you shall never perish. God said... You will have eternal life. How long does eternal life last? Eternally. God is not a liar. He cannot deny himself. The devil says he's a liar. You see, never doubt God's love. Never doubt God's word. It's the anchor of, your, of our soul. And so, how did Satan's attacks how did should have Eve re, uh, replied? Well, she should have relied on God's word. That's the word that goes in that blank. You should have relied on God's word. Right? In Psalm 119, verse 11, it says, Hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. How do we keep on the straight and narrow? Hide God's word in your heart. So then when you get into a situation and... The scripture needs to be brought to the foremind or the front of your mind and you're thinking to recall it, remember it. The Holy Spirit can bring it to mind because it's already in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might sin against thee. Right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. You will not walk in darkness. Ephesians 6 tells us that we need to put on the armor of God. Why? Because we're not on a playground anymore. We're on a battlefield. There are some believers who said, now that I'm saved, I can cross my arms, put up my feet, because I'll be going to heaven. It's all by grace through faith, and I'll be there. No, God saved you out of the slavery to sin and in the darkness to serve him. Why did he bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So that they could serve him. It could be his people. You are my people and I am your God. And these are the regulations on Mount Zion. He poured out the scriptures and saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And he goes on and on and on. You see, he called us in order to serve. Many go to church and says, okay, what can the church do for me? What can the church do for my family? Hey, 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 that's the wrong question. 
It's what can I do for the church? What can I do for God? You see, the church are people. It was John F. Kennedy who said, don't ask what America can do for you, ask what you can do for America. So are you serving? And you know what? If you're serving and you're one of those hidden saints, those nobodies, that's good because God uses nobodies. Moses lived 120 years. 40 years, he said, I'm a somebody. I grew up in the courts of Pharaoh, and I'm going to kill this Hebrew because I'm the deliverer of the people. And then when he killed the Hebrew, he had to run. And he ran into the wilderness. And for 40 years, he realized that he was a nobody. From a somebody to a nobody. And after 40 years of looking after sheep, on the backside of Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, same mountain, God says, hey, I haven't given up on you. <laughs> you think you're a loser? You think you're a failure? I haven't given up on you. Guess what? You come. Now's the time. Moses was 80 years old, right? And he lived to 120. Would you like a major project when you're 80 years old? Some of us want to retire when we're 55 so we can put up our feet. No, 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 no. Moses realized that God could use a somebody. A nobody. God can use a nobody. Be humbled before God. God can use you. It's the little things, a cup of water, a prayer, an encouraging word. Be a builder, not a destroyer. Put on the armor of God because we're attacked by the devil. And in Luke 4 and in Luke Matthew 4, it talks about the temptations of Jesus. How did Jesus fight the devil? It is written. He used scripture. He used scripture. The word in there is scripture. It's written. Yeah, it is written. Do you know scripture? You know, the, uh, we were having a, a lunch with a few guys and and, uh, you know, somebody said, hey, Paul, because one of the guys said, you know, because of COVID and so on, I'm not going to church, you know, and I'm just staying home and doing this and doing that. And one of the other guys said, uh, hey, Paul, what do you think about, you know, staying home from church? And what's your opinion on that? I said, what does the scripture say? Hmm. He says, do not forsake the assemblings of one another. Well, that ended the argument, didn't it? because everybody had their opinion. But that ended the argument. What does the scripture say? That's a good question to ask. And so point number three is that her reply to Satan was that she actually misquoted the word. She added the phrase, 3A, she added the phrase, you must not touch. Do you and I add to God's word? You know? Do you add to God's word? You have to do it this way. We've always done it this way. You know, do you add to God's word? You know, no smoking, no drinking, and no going out with girls who do, that kind of stuff. You add stuff. You know, don't cut your lawn on Sunday. That's a preference. We're living in an age of grace, not law. But we're so judgmental, aren't we? Oh, he mustn't be a Christian because they do this and they do that. Let's not add to the word. Where is it written? And we must not subtract key words because she said, if you do, you will certainly die. She forgot the certainly. She just said, you will die. Know the word. So the warning here is do not add or subtract from God's word. Do not add or subtract. We see that in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. We see that in Proverbs 30, verse 6. I didn't write that down there. We see that in Revelation 20. In three different places, in the beginning of the Bible, in the middle of the Bible, at the end of the Bible, do not add, do not subtract. Well, the judge of all the earth has spoken. Who are we to add or subtract? And then we see that Satan makes lies. You know, he deceives, he throws in ideas and doubts and confusion, and then he comes right out and he says a big fat lie. You will not surely die. 
That's a lie. Because God himself said, if you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. Do you know the scriptures well enough that when somebody says something lie, that you can pick up on it? A few years ago, I was in a particular congregation and doing a particular service. I was sitting in the, in the congregation when the minister uh, stood up and said, you know what? She, she said, I don't believe in the ascension of Christ. Nowhere does it say in the Bible that Christ uh, rose from the earth and went up into heaven. I was going to get up and I say, you got a Bible there? Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The preacher did not know the word and was speaking lies. But of course, the congregation don't normally read the Bible, so they wouldn't be able to know. The truth will set you free, my friends. The truth will set you free. The second lie, you're going to be like God. You will be like God. We do have a major denomination that preaches that. You're going to be like a God. In fact, Father God and Mother God, who are in charge of this particular planet, they actually were, became gods from another planet. You can become a god, right? You can. Some people think they are gods. They put their name up on everything, right? It's all about them. So we need to watch this slippery slope, this slippery slope of temptation. How did it affect Eve and how does it affect us? Well. We, she saw the fruit. She saw the fruit. And so we have a slide here. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to her eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. It was good for food. It was good for food, and it was tempting for the body. Man, when you and I are hungry, don't we just love that hamburger, that Harvey's hamburger or whatever it is, you know, that just like, whew, or that apple or that, that tomato that's really ripe. We just love it, don't we, that food? We go to buffets all the time, right? It's the lust of the flesh. It's the craving for physical pleasure. That's the word that's in that space, pleasure. We live for pleasure. Enjoy life. You deserve it. Take a break. All right? John 1, chapter 2, verse 16. Look it up later on today. Do you crave for physical pleasure? God never said it was all going to be fun. He says you're going to have a tough road. It was good for food. Well, then it was pleasing to the eye. She says here that it was delight to see. Ooh, eye candy. Right? And guess what? That's the temptation of your soul. The soul is who you are on the inside. I want it. I want it. Bigger car, bigger house, whatever it might be. Okay? I just want it. I just want it. I just want it. There's a man who I met who had everything. He had a great job. He had a wonderful wife. He had a family. He had cottage and cars and everything. And then he got cancer. And through some time, he lost his wife. He lost his job, he lost his house, he lost everything. He came to the bottom of the rope, bottom of the barrel, the end of the rope, and he found Jesus. And he told me, he said, I had everything the world offered, but I had nothing. I had not Jesus. Now I have Jesus and I have everything I need. I don't need anything else. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his soul? Do you realize that verse tells you that your soul is equal the worth of everything in the world? You're worth more than a million bucks. You are just precious in God's sight. Your soul is eternity. God has placed in you. Everybody we meet will live forever. It's the only thing is there's two different destinations. Which one will you go to? So she took. So we have the temptation of the soul, the lust of the eyes, craving for everything we see. Everything we see, we need to have it. There's TV shows on herders, you know, they just hoard everything. We've got so much stuff, we don't know what to do. 
I got that problem. I got lots of tools that I know what to do. I've got lots of stuff. But you know, it's like when you need a job to be done, you need, or need the right thing. That's my excuse. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. We crave for everything. Craving, craving. There's isn't even a TV show where, I mean, uh, a system where you can get movies. It's called Crave, right? It's just longing for you to tuck on your heart. It's desirable to make one wise. Don't we want something bigger and better? Don't we want people to look up at us? It's a temptation of your spirit. It's the pride of life. The pride of life in our achievements and our possessions. My goodness, you remember the days in 1912? I don't, I wasn't born then. But anyway, you remember the big Titanic. It was the greatest achievement of mankind. It will never sink and it sunk on its major voyage by an ice cube. Yeah, it was a big ice cube. We will never sink. Pride of life. But by the way, there was a minister on board. How many know there was a minister on board? Nobody. Oh, now you know. There's a minister on board, Reverend Harper. He was supposed to come. He was on his way to come and preach at Moody Bible, Institute, Moody Bible Church in Chicago. And he couldn't, he was an evangelist. He was a pastor. He had a church in England, John Harper. He had a little girl, 12-year-old little girl was on the boat with him. And John Harper couldn't swim. He was already on two ships that went down and he was rescued. And he didn't. He didn't like swimming. He couldn't swim. But when the alarm went off, he took his little girl and he gave it to the officer and said, make sure my girl gets in a lifeboat. And he went around saving souls. God's man in God's place. You are God's man and you're God's woman in your place. He wants to use you. Don't fold your hands and put up your feet and say, no, thanks. I won't be like a Moses. Did you know that Moses came up with five or six excuses? <laughs> I can't speak. They won't listen to me. Who should I send? I'm a nobody. Read Exodus 3 and 4 and 5. You'll find out all the excuses Moses had. And then Moses, God says, listen here, buddy. Moses said, can you send somebody else? He says, oh. God got really angry. And he says, look, okay, fine. I'm bringing your brother Aaron. He's on his way here. But you know what? God's not going to let him off the hook. God's not going to let you off the hook. You, you are his witness. You are the light. You are the salt. You don't have a choice. Same with me. Wow. The pride of life in our achievements and our possessions. What's the application? Well, the application is this. Let's be attentive to obey God's word knowing that there are two results from sin. And the results of this, we know that sin will bring shame. What did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They were ashamed. They saw that they were naked and their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked and they started to cover things up. When you and I do something's wrong, we just, we just run, don't we? You remember when the kids were small and they did something wrong and they go, yeah, dad, yeah, okay, yeah, I did my homework, yeah. And the eyes are down, you don't make a connection because you're afraid to look them in the eye, right? Because we wanna hide, 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 covering it up. They sewed fig leaves together. Hey, maybe that's the first sewing experience. <laughs> they sewed it. Well, you and I know that fig leaves will turn brown and black and they crumble just like the trees and leaves out there. And God had to kill. Yeah, he had to kill a, an animal, cover them with the skin. Covering only covers. Have you ever clean your house and put all the dirt underneath the rug? Just cover it up? Because that's not cleaning, right? That's not cleaning. Jesus was described as the Lamb of God who takes a way. Takes away the sin of the world, yeah. He doesn't cover it up. Payment in full. If I have a debt of $1,000 and I give him $25, he goes, hey, buddy, that doesn't cover your debt. You might be a really nice guy, 
but he doesn't cover it. So he brings shame and he brings separation. Separation. You hide from God, you run away, you're afraid, and we'll look at that later on. Be sure your sins will find you out. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. You say, well, that only applies for non-believers. No, we believers also sin. And when we sin, it separates us from God. Because although we are still a child of God, we're not in fellowship with him. You see the difference? Okay, if my son misbehaves and I don't talk to him for a while, our fellowship is broken, but not our relationship. He's always my son. When you and I disobey God and rebel, you're still his child, but you're not in fellowship. The glass is dirty, the lens is polluted, an instrument unclean, not suitable for the master's use. So I want you today to spend some time this afternoon to think where you are with the Lord. Is there sin in your life? Sin will bring shame. Maybe you're ashamed of it now. And you know what? You say nobody knows. God knows. You can't hide from him. You can't sweep it under the rug. You can't hide it in the closet. You can't hide it under the bed. You can't hide it in between the sheets. God knows. Put it away. Renounce it. Repent. So that we can be a holy people set apart for him. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for this word. You've kind of hit us right between the eyes that we need to be attentive to your word. We need to know the truth and the truth will set us free. Help us not to be lazy daisy and negligent about the truth of your word, but help us to be students of the word who are diligent to obey. You called us to go and make disciples. Only disciples can make disciples. And you told us to go and make disciples and teach them everything that they were taught. Help us to share the truth with some others today. We thank you for the grace. It is only by grace that we're saved. It is only by grace that we serve you. It is only by grace that we're sanctified. It is only by grace that we'll be glorified and have a place in heaven for you. It is all by grace. Help us to be found faithful. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final song. And thank you for listening so well. 279, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. On October 6th, a couple of days ago, or a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago, a year before that, we had Daniel McGinnis accept the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Since this year, he has been, we have been discipling him for an hour and a half to two hours every week. He's come a long way. But I was invited to uh, a friend's house by the name of Gates, and Dan was there, and uh, I brought a loaf of bread just to give an excuse that I was coming over. <laughs> and Gates said to his friend, you know, I want you to meet my pastor friend. Oh, pastor friend. Oh, yeah, oh, he was a little nervous. He thought maybe he'd get up and go. But you know, we shared the gospel with him, and I said, would you like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, yes, I would. And I said, well, maybe you want to go home and think about it. This is an important decision. He said, are you crazy? If I go home and I get hit by a car, I'll be going to hell. I'm going to do it right now. Ooh, he was determined. And then I asked, and then I thought, okay. So we put him in a, we asked him to sit in the middle of the chair, and Gates and I put our arms around him and our hands upon him, and we, we said, this is what we're going to do, is ask Jesus, like, admit ABCs. Admit that you're a sinner. You can't make it on your own. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, you are the Savior of the world. I want you to be mine. I believe that you're the Son of God. You died for my sins. I call upon you. I commit myself to walk in your way. Just do what you need to do in my life. So that's what Daniel did. And when he got up, he said, Whew, I feel lighter. I feel lighter. I'm walking a different path. Walking a different path. And over the months we spent time with him, he said, he said, a few weeks before you uh, accepted the Lord, I was thinking of taking my own life. Yeah. 
My dear brother and sister, if you are listening here today, you might have been a, go a church goer all your life, but you've never made that decision. You're playing the game. You're saying one thing, but living out another. Do not do that. Get right with God, put your cards on the table and say, this is who I am, just as I am, without any excuses, I want you to be my savior. That's what it's at. And then we'll see you again in glory when the time comes, but not that soon, right? I want you here next week too. And so trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what was the proof of the pudding? Well, that Daniel hungered for the word of God. He's got cataracts in his eyes, but you know what? He's got a magnifier, and he's got lights, and he's reading the Bible every day. He's reading a psalm every day, a Proverbs every day, and you know what? That truth is setting him free, and he has insights into the Word of God that Christians for a long time don't ever see because Christians are reading a lot of commentaries, but not the real stuff. Wow. I think I've challenged you long enough, and I do thank you for listening to me. I, uh, I'm a preacher, I'm long-winded, but when I was younger, my dad preached a long time, and my mother complained, and I said, well, dad, uh, Mom, God had a lot of things to say today. So, he spoke to you today. So don't ignore him. Don't ignore him. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are right now, God has put you there. He has a purpose for you being there. He who indwells you has something that he wants to do through you just where you are. Believe this, believe this, and go in his grace, his love, and his power. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for uh, Jared and Richard with the media, and thank you for...